So here we go. Um, religious belief faces, as you know, various intellectual challenges, and you know, a famous critic, obviously, is Richard Dawkins, who maintains that science is a threat to religious belief. Um, some people, by no means all, of course, but some religious people appeal to Wittgenstein's thinking in order to explain why it is that actually Richard Dawkins' ta uh, criticisms are off target, um, that actually religious belief is immune to that kind of criticism. <coughs> Here's a, a quote from Wittgenstein's Lectures and Conversations, which is often wheeled out uh, in this context. He says, if you ask me whether or not I believe in a judgment day, in the sense in which religious people have belief in it, I wouldn't say, no, I don't believe there will be such a thing. It would seem to me utterly crazy uh, to say this. And then I give the explanation. I don't believe in, but then the religious person never believes what I describe, he says. I can't say, I can't contradict that person. So there seems to be perhaps two things going on here. Certainly this passage has been interpreted in this way. <clears throat> First of all, there's the suggestion that when atheists like Dawkins and so on deny the beliefs they take to be expressed by such sentences as God exists and God created the world and Jesus rose from the dead and we will face the judgment day, they fail to contradict the religious beliefs that such sentences are used to express. <coughs> and the second claim which you sometimes find made uh, in this context is, I call it immunity. Uh, even if an atheist were successfully to refute the belief that they take such a sentence to express, God exists, say, by providing empirical ed evidence to the contrary, for example, they would fail thereby to refute the religious belief expressed. So there are two claims then. I call them no contradiction and uh, immunity. <coughs> but why should we suppose that the atheist cannot contradict the religious person and indeed that what the religious person is committed to is something that the atheist uh, cannot refute? <coughs> why suppose that? Well, Wittgenstein certainly suggests that the way in which religious language is used differs from the way in which scientific language is used. Sorry, you yeah, I'm doing my best actually. I'm just. <laughs> <coughs> I'll <coughs> clear my throat and try to speak a bit more loudly. Uh, God exists and electrons exist appear similar on the page and to the ear. Those sentences look similar, but they are used very differently. That seems to be the suggestion here. And because meaning and use are linked, meaning is use, is a slogan sometimes associated with Wittgenstein. Um, so because these sentences are used in very different ways, so they have a very different kind of meaning. That seems to be the suggestion. Um, but how exactly is religious language used? And why should we suppose that these two claims, no contradiction and immunity, why should we suppose that they follow from the thesis that you know, religious language is used in this, in this other way? So what I'm going to give you now are three leading interpretations of Wittgenstein on how religious language is used. I think these are probably the three leading contenders. Okay? So this is going to be a quick potted history or a a overview of the various views that are, that are associated with Wittgenstein on this topic. Uh, Wittgenstein's writing is opaque. I don't claim to know what Wittgenstein's position is. I'm just going to look at these three leading interpretations of Wittgenstein, and I'm going to suggest that uh, none of them provide a plausible account on which no contradiction and immunity follow. So I'm going to be quite sceptical about this kind of Wittgensteinian approach to immunising religious belief. <coughs> this is what I call them, non-cognitivism. Secondly, juice of views. And thirdly, the atheist minus view. So let's begin with non-cognitivist accounts of how religious language is used. <coughs> the suggestion here is that when people say things like God exists and Jesus rose from the dead, they're not making claims at all. They're using language in some other way. This is not an assertion, something else 
is going on. Language is being used in another way. They might look like claims. The atheist might be seduced into thinking that claims are being put forward, but they are not. Religious language is used in another way. So how is it used? Well, one, ex one suggestion is that when we say, when the religious person says God exists, they're actually expressing an attitude. Uh, this is a bit like emotivism in ethics, if you've come across uh, that view. <clears throat> the idea is that rather than making a claim, you express yourself using religious language. You express how you feel. It's a bit like going boo or hooray or oh wow, okay? None of those things are true or false. They are expressions of how you feel about things. And the suggestion is that to say God exists is not to make a claim, as you would be making a claim were you to say electrons exist. Rather, you're emoting, you're expressing how you feel about the, say, the fact that the, you know, the universe exists at all. You're giving vent to that feeling. So that's one view which is associated with Wittgenstein, in particular by Hans-Johann Glock. He interprets Wittgenstein in this non-cognitivist way. I personally don't find that interpretation very plausible so far as most religious people, people are concerned. They don't seem to be using religious language in that way, in fact. Um, so, you know, there are some fairly obvious counterexamples that you could wheel out. Um, it seems that the proportion of Christians for whom it's irrelevant whether the resurrection actually historically happened is very small, but it would be irrelevant if no historical claim is made by those who say Jesus rose from the dead. Okay? No, it matters to them that this actually historically happened, and so there is a claim to which they are committed. They're not just expressing themselves. Um, it's also hard to see why there's an evidential problem of evil if the Christian makes no claim for there to be any evidence against. Right? Surely they are committed to something, a thesis there, and they see that there is at least potentially a problem, that there is at least potentially evidence against what it is that they're committed to. Well, that cannot be true if, non if the non-cognitivist view is correct. So non-cognitivism is just not plausible, it seems to me. Uh, now, another kind of view that you find associated with Wittgenstein, I'll call the juicer view, <clears throat> after John Cottingham, borrowing his analogy here. Here's a little quote from John Cottingham. He says that analytic philosophers are often prone to use the fruit juicer method when approaching modes of thought of which they are sceptical. They require the clear liquid of a few propositions to be extracted for examination in isolation from what they take to be the irrelevant pulpy mush of context. Someone who has only tasted strawberries via the output of the juicer and has firmly decided this is not for me may turn out to have a radically impoverished grasp of what it is about the fruit that makes the strawberry lover so enthusiastic. So the idea then is that the atheist is really missing out on a great deal. They fail fully to appreciate what it is that the religious person is committed to, what it is that the religious person is committed to when they make these kinds of utterance. Okay? Um, so the idea is that this is not non-cognitivism because there are beliefs, right? there are things, claims to which the religious person is committed. However, the real meaning and significance of something, a sentence like God exists or Jesus rose from the dead, is lost on atheist critics like Richard Dawkins who extract only a thin juice from such utterances when in fact there are great, you know, there are further rich dimensions of meaning and significance that are entirely lost on the atheist. And because of that, so that so when they try and target the religious commitment, the religious belief, so they miss the target because they're, 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 missing, they're, they're missing this bigger picture. So We'll call that the standard juicer argument. Is that Cottingham's argument? I'm not sure, actually. I've borrowed his analogy, but I'm not sure he would endorse that particular argument. Um, here's the punchline. The real meaning uh, extends beyond what the atheist critic grasps. The atheist is only getting a little bit of it, the juice. They're missing out on the wider meaning, the wider significance. Uh, and for that reason, then, you might suppose that atheists cannot contradict what the religious person believes, and, in, and indeed that atheist attempts at refutation are off-target. Uh, I don't buy that as an argument. 
um, seems to me that's a poor argument for no contradiction and uh, immunity. So here's my counterexample. Suppose um, John says, Otto is a kraut, using that word in an insulting way about a German person, what they, what they take to be a German person. Um, suppose that Mary is insult blind. She's got a tin ear when it comes to insult. She just doesn't get it. She doesn't, doesn't understand that language is sometimes used in this insulting way. So there's a dimension to the meaning of kraut that passes her by entirely. Right? So she thinks it just means German. Right? Now, um, if she says uh, to John, no, you're mistaken, Otto is not a kraut, he's not German, right? she's right. Uh, she, she is contradicting uh, this person, and indeed she has shown that person to be mistaken, despite the fact that she's missing out on higher levels of meaning and significance, that these are all entirely passing her by, nevertheless, her criticism is entirely appropriate, and indeed, she has shown that what this person is committed to is not true. So, similarly then, even if the atheist is missing out on higher levels of meaning and significance, you know, no doubt they are in many, in many cases, um, it doesn't follow from that that the atheist um, cannot contradict and indeed straightforwardly refute what it is that the religious person is committed to in much the, much the same way as Mary, who has a tin ear to insult, so the atheist may have a tin ear to religious significance, doesn't matter. They can still contradict and indeed potentially refute what it is that the religious person is committed to. So it seems to me that that kind of juice of view just doesn't deliver no, no, non-contradiction, doesn't deliver immunity. <coughs> we might try a different view, okay, <coughs> a different kind of juice of view which I call the strong juice of you, which I think is held by our uh, engineer, Sean Bamsfeld. I think that's how you pronounce the name. Um, now the suggestion is that the Christian is committed to claims, so it's not, it's not a non-cognitivist view, <coughs> but there's no overlap at all between the claim made on the atheist's understanding of the sentence and the claim actually made by the religious person. So it's not that the atheist gets a bit of the meaning, <laughs> but not all of it. No, they've grasped an entirely different meaning to that which uh, is uh, connected to this sentence by the religious person. And it might, for example, be a metaphorical meaning. So, um, Sean Bamsfeld mentions this particular anal um, metaphor, for example. So, in Romeo and Juliet, Romeo says, Juliet is the sun. <coughs> Suppose Mary, uh, who's not very good with uh, metaphors, uh, hears this and says, but hang on, Juliet is obviously not the sun. She's not a massive hot object about which the earth rotates. Now, clearly, Mary would have in got entirely the wrong end of the stick. She's completely misunderstood what it is that's being said by the person who's using language metaphorically. There's no overlap at all in this case between what she thinks the person means and what they actually mean. <clears throat> so call that the strong juice of you. Similarly, if God exists and Jesus rose from the dead are used wholly metaphorically then, and the atheist fails to grasp the metaphor, then the atheist will fail to contradict or refute what the Christian says, you might suggest. Call that the strong juice of you. So on the strong juice of you, the religious person is committed to a claim but there's no overlap at all between the claim they're committed to and the claim the atheist thinks that they are committed to. Uh, again, I don't find this very plausible, uh, this view. It seems to me implausible as an account of religious belief. Uh, when atheists give arguments against the claims that they take religious people to be committed to, the religious person will typically respond with a counter-argument. <coughs> That makes no sense if the religious person actually makes no commitment to such claims. So, for example, consider the problem of evil. The religious person suggests there are perhaps unknown good justifying reasons for the observed evils that we see. They might say that in response to the evidential problem of evil. That makes no sense 
if language is being used in an entirely metaphorical way. That would be a bit like Romeo's responding to Mary by suggesting that the evidence that Juliet is not a massive hot body about which the earth rotates is less than decisive. That just isn't how Romeo is going to respond, right, if he's using language metaphorically. It's not an appropriate response. The fact that almost all religious people do respond in that way very strongly suggests that they're not using language in a wholly metaphorical way. So this view too is not plausible, the strong use of you. So we now come to what I call the, the atheist minus view. <coughs> the suggestion now is that uh, the atheist meaning extends far beyond the religious meaning rather than the other way around. The atheist is actually building into <laughs> the content of the belief a lot more than they should be building in, a lot more than is built in by the religious person. So, for example, you might say that perhaps for a religious person, God means uh, an omnipotent, omnibenevolent omni being. This is a, obviously a ridiculously simplified version or example. Uh, whereas the atheist means an omnipotent, omnibenevolent being that lives on a cloud. See, they've added something. They've added some extra content to the belief, more than the, athe than the theist is committed to. In which case, if the atheist says there is no God, it's true, they will fail to contradict the theist's claim that there is a God, because you can now see that clearly they might both be correct. You know, if there is an omnipotent, non omnibenevolent being, but he doesn't live on a cloud, or well, the atheist, right, and the theist, right, so they're not contradicting each other, no contradiction comes out as true. So the atheist minus view would deliver no contradiction. Uh, or, a slightly more plausible illustration, um, suppose the theist uses God in such a way that God is not a thing. Um, atheists maybe think of God as an extra thing or something that exists in addition to all of the other things that there are, including the universe. Okay? And theists will often say, oh no, 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 you've, you've misunderstood. We don't think of God as like an, an additional entity in, in, in addition to uh, the universe and, and, its, and its various contents. So theologian Dennis Turner says, it's no use supposing that you disagree with me if you say there's no such thing as God, for I got there well before you, <laughs> right? <laughs> says Dennis Turner, right? Um, so you can see that this is a version of the atheist minus view. The atheist is adding more content to theism than they should be. <clears throat> If the atheist understands God as a thing or a something and the theist doesn't, then when the atheist says there is no God, they will indeed fail to contradict what the theist is committed to. So we now have these three views, just, uh, just to remind you where we are before I get to my criticism of the atheist minus view. There's the juice of view, there's the non-cognitivist view on which no claim is made at all, okay, uh, by the religious person when they say God exists. There's the juice of view on which the religious meaning extends far beyond the, uh, what, what the atheist is capable of grasping. There's the strong juice of view, juice of view on which there's the atheist's meaning and then there's the religious meaning and there's no overlap at all between these. And then there's the atheist minus view on which the religious meaning is, if you like, a sort of a slimmed down version of the atheist meaning. Perhaps the atheist um, has taken certain analogies too literally. You know, maybe the atheist is thinking of God the Father as you know, a bloke upstairs that's literally looking down at us. Then the atheist is building more content into theism than the theist ever intended should be in there. So misunderstanding analogies will, will result in the, in the atheist minus view. Uh, here's my criticism of the atheist minus view. Number one, it's implausible for many target sentences. Uh, what the typical Christian commits themselves to by saying Jesus rose from the dead is not plausibly less <laughs> than the atheist understands it to mean. I mean, they may mean a lot more, but they don't, <laughs> they don't mean less than actually a certain individual historically did come back uh, from the grave. If that's true, uh, then the atheist minus view is uh, incorrect. Secondly, the atheist minus view fails to guarantee immunity. If I can show that there is no omnipotent and omnibenevolent being, then I do refute what the atheist can believes, even if I also happen mistakenly to think of God as a thing or indeed as living on a cloud. It doesn't matter. The fact that I've built this extra content in is irrelevant. My criticism is still on target. So the atheist minus view, minus view is implausible for many target sentences and it also fails to guarantee immunity, although it does to some extent deliver 
no contradiction. Uh, third criticism. Given what the religious belief is on the atheist minus view less than what the atheist initially supposes, atheists can immediately grasp and contradict what the religious person believes by just dropping the commitment that they originally thought the belief involved. So, you know, I stupidly thought that God was a being that lives on a cloud as well as being omnipotent and omnibenevolent. Um, I now realise that, you know, that's a mistake. Uh, theists aren't committed to a being that lives on a cloud, so I just crossed that out then. And now, 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 now we're on the same page. Yeah? Now, now, now we mean the same thing. It's easy to do that. And now I can contradict you and potentially refute what it is that you're saying. So it's, it's, it's not difficult to get around this problem so far as uh, no contradiction is concerned. So look, here's my conclusion then. Um, we've looked at a number of views associated with Wittgenstein, rightly or wrongly. I don't claim that any of these are Wittgenstein's view. We've had a quick look at those views, at how they're supposed to work, why it is that they're supposed to deliver no contradiction and immunity. Um, but it seems to me that they all fall down in one way or another. Either they're just not very plausible as accounts of how religious language is being used, or if they are more plausible, and I think the juicer view is fairly plausible, actually. Unfortunately, it fails to deliver immunity and uh, no contradiction. So if you're looking to Wittgenstein um, in order to provide a sort of get out of jail free card uh, when it comes to the criticisms of uh, atheist critics, think again, <laughs> because um, you may find that either you're signing yourself up to Wittgensteinian or views which may or may not be Wittgenstein's views which actually are going to strip your belief of that which probably makes it important to you. You know, you're going to take the content out. You'll end up with something like no non-cognitivism, say. Or um, it's not going to work anyway. Um, so it seems to me that these kind of Wittgensteinian moves don't succeed. Maybe there are some others out there. Um, I've got another suggestion that we could talk about maybe if, there's, if, if there isn't time, so I won't be talking about that. Uh, I really, I should open this up to some questions now. I've got five minutes. Thank you. <laughs> oh, and, um, <laughs>